How you doing this morning? We're going to start early because we have a lot to pack in today. Hope you brought your lunch. Just want to see if anybody's listening. <laughs> Have you, been, have, you, have you been following the, the Facebook, we were talking about earlier, the Facebook conversation, Laurel versus Yanny? No, you haven't been following it? It's Yanny, is it? You, you don't care, it's Yanny, okay. Um, well, some people say it's Laurel. Um, it's, a, it's a wave frequency that you hear things. And uh, I saw a post this week about pastors, we understand that all the time. We say things all the time and you hear totally, totally different. You don't even listen to us. Anyway, uh, we're, we're here to have a great time of fellowship in the Lord, uh, fellowshipping with one another. Uh, we're here to, uh, to worship. Uh, we're here to grow. We're here to learn how we can serve. Uh, we're here to uh, look at God's Word and, and ask the tough questions about, God, what do you want out of my life? God, what are you calling me to do? Uh, so we're going to do that as a congregation uh, here this morning. If you are a guest with us today, thank you so much for being a part of us, and we're going to invite you to participate with us in all aspects of our worship. I'm going to invite you back next week for our 9 o'clock Sunday school time. It's our connection groups that begin in those small groups, that kind of in your, whether it's age category or it's topic, uh, but you're in there together to learn, and that's really where the dynamic of the Christian life is really beginning to live out, because you can talk with each other, um, you can um, begin to, to live life together to those, those groups. We have other groups throughout the week that are meeting. Uh, some are ending up here in a couple weeks, take a break for the summer. We'll start back up uh, in August and September. Uh, we're, we have a great time here as a body. We invite you to be a part of that. Uh, don't shy away. There was a great post I read this week. Uh, I read it on Wednesday, and I think Michelle wrote it. And it was a wonderful email that she sends out every Wednesday that talked about doing life together. Don't feel like you're all alone. Say, I, I, I'm the only one going through this. And we kind of walk through our, our church life being silent. And we're afraid to share it. It's okay to let some things out and talk. Because you'll be surprised at how, how, how much somebody else has been praying for you to realize somebody else is going through that or they've been through it, and you can live life together. Um, so learn to, to, that's where that Sunday school group comes into play, those connection groups. Uh, they're so vital uh, for that very reason. So don't feel like you're doing life alone. As a congregation, we'll worship as a large group, and I, my prayer is that as we do, you will feel connected to the larger body of Christ. And once again, look around. We're all living life together. There's not a single perfect person here. And so as we worship, I want you to know that, um, that, that we're not perfect. And if God deals with you on, on life issues, respond to that. And we're here to come around you and love you and work with you. So as we begin, we do want to go before the Lord. We want to pray. And then we're going to be called into a music time of worship. Uh, we'll have a time of giving, message, and then a response time. So would you stand with me this morning? Uh, stand in, in, in the reverence uh, coming before the Father. Father, we come before you. We thank you. We thank you for the victory that you uh, have given us through your son, Jesus. Father, show us the path of victory. Father, teach us how we can live victorious. Uh, show us how to be your child. I know, Father, that in this world there will be troubles. Troubles will, will not define us, but your victory will. So, Father, my prayer is as a congregation this morning, uh, we will be encouraged by one another. We will be encouraged by the, the, the voice of your spirit. We'll be encouraged by the word, the Bible, that you have inspired, you wrote it through man, so that we then would have a, a, a testimony of your grace. Father, thank you for the victory. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Amen. Amen.
about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again, and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. So Jesus came and brought to me the victory.
is like him, the lion and the lamb, seated on the Mountains bow down, every ocean roars to the Lord of hosts. Praise at the night, from the rising of the sun to the end of every day. Praise at the night, all the nations of the earth, all the angels and the saints sing praise. is like him, the lion and the lamb, seated on the throne. Mountains bow down, every ocean roars to the Lord of hosts. Praise at a night, from the rising of the sun to the end of every day. All the nations of the earth, all the angels and the saints sing praise at a night. From the rising of the sun to the end of every day, praise at a night. All the nations of the earth, all the angels and the saints sing praise. can be dismissed to Children's Church at this time. Let's pray. Father, we love you and thank you for this day. And Father, just um, what a glorious day it is. 
Father, just um, as we come upon graduation, I ask you to be with those seniors that are graduating, Father, and, and just guide them and into their future endeavors. And Father, just let them be, let them glorify you in everything they do. Father, I just um, I want to thank you for, for everyone here today, and Father, just um, give you the glory in everything that, that, that is done in this church. And Father, just um, I ask you to be with this gift and, and the givers. Father, just um, just lift lift each one up. I ask this thing in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Good morning, church. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Martine, for a beautiful song and uh, wonderful uh, to bring us to this time of worship together. We're looking at families, and uh, we want to honor three of our, our graduates, uh, three of the, the wonderful uh, 
boys that we have. We have a, a good class of boys. Uh, Henry, come on up. Henry, come on up. And uh, Josh, come on up. And Logan, come on up. Um, we have a great treat for them this afternoon. We're taking the youth on a rock climbing adventure. And these three guys are going to bring the youth devotion today. So you need to pray for them, okay? <laughs> and uh, we, we are... Uh, we are saddened by this day because we're going to lose these three guys from our youth, but we're also excited because we get to pass them on to the adults. <laughs> We've had our shot at them, now you guys get to help finish them off. Um, but each of them have got a, a great career path lined out as God is, is preparing uh, them for the next step. And uh, in, in the process, uh, we have a gift for you. Um, and, and hopefully this, this gift will be utilized as you um, venture into the world of, oh, man, I just, Josh. Josh. Thank you. If they have the wrong names, you know who each other are, okay? Just swap them. I worked real hard at that. I um, want to give you the gift. Um, as you get gifts, sometimes you wonder, will I ever use this? And hopefully the purpose of, of the gift will be used. You'll actually look at it and uh, process it um, and, and begin to grow with it. And you'll share the wisdom that you have learned to this point with others. Um, as, as we as a family get to celebrate, we had Henry's yesterday uh, celebration. Uh, Josh is coming up next week. Uh, we get to celebrate with the lambs. Um, and then Logan's is the following week. We get to celebrate with, with Logan's family. And they're in the worship guide. You see that? And really celebrate them, pray for them. And we're going to have a, a time of prayer right now for them as they uh, move on. As uh, Henry's going to Ivy Tech and then to the police academy. At least that's today, right? Yeah. As of today, that's the plan. Logan's at ISU studying online, working in a rock quarry. Okay. And Josh has uh, got an internship at Crown. Um, so kind of for the summer, so excited about that. If you go on Mondays to, uh, to uh, Almost Home, uh, ask for Josh to put your salads together. I hear he's a fantastic chef on the side of that. So, uh, but going to Ivy Tech and then engineering at IUPUI. Did I get that right? Oh, wow. I worked hard, real hard on that initials. Uh, will you pray with us today? Father, we come before you as we think about families and all that's going on. Um, it's my privilege to, to pray for Henry today. And looking at, uh, Father, what you're doing in his life and what he's doing in the church, uh, what he's doing in ministry. Uh, Father, you, you, are, you, you have weaved a perfect plan for him. My prayer is, Father, you, you will lead him every step of the way. Father, I thank you for Logan. I thank you for his coming to faith since I've been here. And, and uh, Father, I, I thank you for what you have, have gifted him with. And, Father, once again, you're weaving a wonderful plan for him. Um, and my prayer is that you will continue to guide every step of his way. And he will, uh, Father, lean towards you. And Father, thank you for Josh and his leadership in and, and different aspects of, of this church and, and even in the community. Father, give each of these young men um, an opportunity to serve you. Show them, Father, how they can be uh, your man in those circles of influence. Father, bless them this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Your Bibles turn to the book of Genesis chapter 3. Are we on? There we go. Genesis chapter 3. Uh, we're going to, to look at where did poor choices start with? Have you ever met somebody and you said, man, you just make poor choices? Have you ever met that person? You can nudge him if he's next to you. Uh, it just seems like he cannot make or she cannot make the right choice. And, and you kind of wonder, how does that ever happen? How do we make the same bad choice over and over again? Um, if you have ever thought about that or, or somebody's ever asking you, you say, I, don't, I just don't know. Um, some people are just born with this uh, inability to make the right choice. I don't know what it is, but the reality is it all comes from Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3 will guide us in the understanding of poor choices. 
As we've been going through this, this series of family feuding, it's dealing with the crisis of hand of the family. And that within the family, uh, there is this um, amazing um, fight going on within the family. And as the family fights, so does the culture. So whatever happens in the family unit happens in your culture. Whatever happens in the family unit happens in the church. Whatever happens in the family unit spreads. So I say, what is the reason for the chaos in our culture? It's the family. The family is the, the core issue here. And as we've been looking at this, we've been wanting to seek God's truth uh, because there are five issues that, that always seem to come to the surface when we deal with family feuds. One is, uh, number five is anger. Four is selfishness, the entitlement mentality. Five is parenting differences. Number two is the, the immorality within the families, adultery uh, before or during uh, marriage. Uh, we have a huge crisis going on there. Uh, and then number one is financial pressure. We live in a financially driven culture. And those things combined oftentimes in one little ball causes the family to just go through crisis after crisis exploding. The goal, though, is to realize it doesn't have to be that way. The goal is to realize that God has a plan, God has a way in which we can survive in this culture even when there is struggles. And there will be struggles. There is no family that has, has lived ever, ever said, you know, we made it through that any crisis. If they tell you that, they're lying, okay? Every family goes through, everybody goes through those crisis moments. We looked at how to win a fight. That is reshaping the argument. It's not about I'm going to win or you're going to win. It's about how can we win as a family. Uh, we have, have looked at the good, the bad, and ugly of parenting. The good was to pray for each other. Uh, the bad is don't play favorites. And the ugly is dishonoring mom and dad dishonoring God. That, that, that becomes the, the ugly part. That's where our children come into play. But today we're going to look at poor choices. Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3 is uh, the issue with the apple. Um, or it could have been a fig. It could have been any number of things. But we have a tree that God planted in the middle of the garden. And God said, you could have everything surrounding this, but don't eat of that tree. Have you ever been down that path? You can have everything, but not that. <laughs> that is like the biggest drawing card to find out, why can't I have that? We're going to look at this decision, to eat or to not to eat. And their choice, because of what happens here, is what we're dealing with today. It's the consequences of a poor choice. And we're living out of that today. Now, we can't blame Adam and Eve, and we'll look at this in just a minute, but I want you to know because of their choice, it brought sin into humanity, and now we're all guilty of our own decision to eat or not to eat. As we go through this, there are two things I do need to clarify. One is that what is a circumstance? Uh, when we take a look at, 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 at life, you come against circumstances. Now, circumstances are the situations you have no control over. Okay? You have no control over circumstances that come your way. These are the things that happen, and it had nothing to do with you. It had everything to do with what was around you. Um, if, you if you get sick, you didn't ask for the flu. How many of you asked for the flu? You don't ask for that. It, it, it just, you just get that, okay? Circumstances come. Somebody hits you in the parking lot. You didn't ask that. You didn't have a big target there and it said, hit me, you know. <laughs> Maybe some of you have cars that you like hit, but um, we don't ask for those things, circumstances. But then there are the consequences. These are the situations that occur because of your poor choice. You're living in consequences because of the choice that you made. If you're going through uh, a life situation, you have to understand, is it, is it a circumstance beyond my control, that I just, and as a family, we're living through that, or is it a consequence of poor choices? As we look at this decision, we have to ask ourselves the family, am I, am I leading my family men in a right way that can bring us through the, the circumstances? Am I leading uh, my family in, in such a way 
that maybe there have been some poor choices made, but we're going to make the steps of obedience to move through it. And here's the good news. You don't have to make the same, same poor choice twice. <laughs> you know, we're going to make a poor choice every now and then, but you don't have to make the same one. You can, you can learn to say no. You can learn to make the right choice. Have you ever been to a restaurant and you got something that was really bad? It didn't taste good at all. Have you ever been there? Yeah, yeah not on Mondays when Josh is there, but any other day of the week. You may go back to the restaurant, but you don't order that again. Number five on the menu, don't order number five. <laughs> that decision's poor. So you learn not to do that. You learn not to go to that shop or, or to that car dealer or, 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 or here or there. You learn that that was a bad choice, had some bad circumstances come out of it or consequences, and therefore, I'm not going to do that again. How many of you ever were, were dared to touch an electric fence? How many times did you do it? Just once? A lot. Some of you are slow learners. Um, you know, we, we touch it once, we learn, oh, that is not a good thing to do. We can learn not to touch the electric fence. So that's the good thing is you're going to come up with choices, and sometimes you're going to fail at them. But that doesn't mean you're a failure unless you continue to do it and do it and gravitate toward it because you're allowing that pleasure for the moment. There's something about the electric fence that just energizes you. Like, oh, I like that. But we can look at God's word and we can, we, can, we can overcome that decision. We can overcome it. So we want to, to process this decision now as it is put forth in the garden. There's this decision of it, will Adam and Eve eat of this tree that God says don't eat. And we know that what happens is they're going to do it. So let's take a look in verse, uh, verse 7. It says, after they have eaten this, and the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and they made themselves loin coverings. Here's the overall consequence. The overall consequence is shame. The overall consequence of a bad decision is shame. Look at verse 8. It says, then, and then heard, then they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees in the garden. And so we begin to see their eyes were open. They realized that something was wrong, and they hid themselves. There was shame because they, were, they didn't want God to see them in their condition. They begin to hide. When you make a poor decision, you want to hide from that. Why? Because you know that it was bad. They realize, oh, we should not have eaten that because now they can see some things they shouldn't have understood. We often want to hide because we're embarrassed, we're ashamed of how we really are. We don't want to get people get too close to us because they get too close they'll see what's really happening. And so we, 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 we put up this fence. We put up this facade. And we live life as if everything is okay. I want you to, I, I, I really want you to learn to be exposed before God. Expose yourself for who you are. Don't be afraid of God. Oftentimes we think we're not good enough. Somebody has said, you're not good enough for God. God's a holy God. You're a sinner. And then all of a sudden that be real, we come to the realization that, therefore, I can't come before God. And that's, that's that shame. They, they were hiding from God. And, and the whole goal of this is that we would just learn to be responsible before God, first and foremost, as an individual. Take yourself out of your family. Take yourself out of your work environment. Take yourself out of your church position and to realize that first and foremost, it's about you. You're the only one that can, tro contro can, can control you. Nobody else can control you. Are you willing to come before God just as you are? The great hymn, Just As I Am that has brought many to the throne of God because we realize we come just as we are. We don't, have to, we don't have to pretend anymore. 
We all have weaknesses. We all have addictions. We all have hang-ups. There's not a single one of us that's here that, that, that's perfect. And, and the goal is to realize, well, where does this shame come from? It comes from hiding from God. We're hiding. And we need to come this morning and just apologize to God. God, I'm sorry. I've made poor choices. And they're all because I did what you asked me not to do. I've made the poor choice. May we strive together to come out of the shame and come before God and come clean. That's what repentance is. Repentance is coming clean from the poor choices that we've made. So there is shame. Immediately there was shame. But the second part was blame. All of a sudden, there was the blame game going on. Because God asked, well, who told you? Who was the one that told you were naked? Who was the one that, 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 that even brought this situation to your eyes? What happened? And immediately, we go to blame. You see, here, here's what happens is we're in the midst of a consequence. We want to make it a circumstance. Remember, a circumstance is something that's outside of your control that you're living with and you've got to deal with. A consequence is that you made this decision and now you have to live with the consequence of that decision. But oftentimes, in the middle of that consequence, we want to make it a circumstance. And that's exactly what Adam did. God, God's talking to him. And he said, well, who told you, have you eaten of the tree which I command you not to eat? In verse 11, verse 12, here it is. The man said, the woman, <laughs> the woman made me eat this tree. But that wasn't really the real blame. It's the woman that you made for me. God, you are the reason for my mistake. It's my environment, it's my, it's my makeup. God, you made me this way, so therefore the reason that I am this way, I'm living in the consequences of my decision, is because of you, God, I'm going to blame you. Have you ever done that? We're always blaming God. We're always blaming somebody else because we don't want to take ownership of the consequence of my decision. It's the blame. Well, not only does Adam do it, but Eve does it too. Now, Eve doesn't blame God. You say, well, she's holier than Adam because Adam went against God. She did the Flip Wilson deal. Everybody remember Flip Wilson? What was his line? The devil made me do it. It's Satan. God, it's Satan's fault. Once again, casting the blame. I'm not the blame. I'm not the one that caused it. Satan made me do it. Once again, we come to the issue of blame. We want to cast it off. We don't want to take ownership for the decision that we made that was poor. We want to make it somebody else's that's outside of our control. God is outside of our control. Satan is outside of our control. We can't control them. We can't control others. And so we're going to blame somebody else. The reason we have family feuds is because we can't own it. We can't own it. But I want you to know that God's holy and just, and he doesn't buy into that. He knows who did it. He knows what was happening in the garden. He wasn't off in a distant universe creating some other planet and starting over. He was right there. He was there. He saw it. He knew it. And I'm so thankful that he's a righteous father and a just father who knows how to handle his children. <laughs> He knows how to handle them. And so we begin to see the individual consequences of the poor choices. And so then God then brought the serpent and said, the serpent, who, who was Satan, he fell because he wanted to usurp God's authority. And now he was cast down to, to roam this world. He is still in this world. But I want you to know that he has his consequence coming. He is defeated. He is defeated. He may have limited power, but it's limited for a short time. He is defeated. So we know that in verses 14 and 15. We'll see the greatest defeat in, the, in Jesus' ministry when he dies on the cross and he rises again from the dead. We, we know that he is, he is defeated. Revelation tells us he will be cast into the lake of fire. 
He is defeated. But we have the, the woman's consequences. There are two of them. The first one we're just going to mention and move on, the pain in childbirth. Moving on. <laughs> the women don't want to move on, but <laughs> you're like, talk about that a little bit. Tell us about it. I, I can't talk about it because I, I didn't go through it. Number two, though, desire for authority. In verse 16, it says, you desire, your desire will be for your husband. And he should rule over you. God set up the family relationship as husband of, as the head. Now, that doesn't mean the husband is a dictator. It, it, it's not talking about he's a slave driver and the, the wife's a doormat. That's the culture's understanding of this text. They look at the text and say, see, all you Christians, you're wrong. You're wrong. But that is not what is intended here. That's not even what the Hebrew is in here. It doesn't mean the wife is invaluable. It doesn't mean that she's worthless. It doesn't even mean that she didn't have a say. It has no reference to that whatsoever. So what is this point? Since he's not a dictator, he's not a ruler, he, he's... He, 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 he doesn't abandon his family. Okay, it has nothing to do with that. She has value. She has worth. She has say. So why, why, is, why is the husband the head and, and she is what, what we, we, we call the, the wife, the, uh, the one to come alongside, to compliment, to help mate? See, he is to lead and take responsibility for the physical and spiritual well-being. He's to lead in that way. He is to guide in that way. To know this, that, that women are equal but different. Say that with me. Equal but different. Understand that we're equal, but we're different. God loves women and men the same. He doesn't say, man, I love you more than her. Or he didn't say, I love her more than, no, it, it's equal. But we're very different. We have strengths and weaknesses that complement each other. In the wisdom of God, he brought us together. But in there, he gave a role. And in that role, we are to follow. When God created his angels, he gave them a role. Lucifer the beautiful angel, tried to usurp God, take his authority. When he tried to rise up and take the authority of sovereign God, he got cast out. And so here's the consequence. This concept, desire for your husband, is that to desire for the authority role within the family. When she desires for the authority and that role in the family, you'll have a family feud. That is the consequence that we deal with today, is understanding that we're equal but different. Understanding strength and weakness, understanding roles and working together and not usurping a role. And so he said, here's the consequence, is you're going to have to deal with this, this idea of usurping authority. So women, you have some confidence. Women, you, you have consequences. And as, as you live, you have to understand that a lot of the conflict that you go through comes out of this one issue right here. But men, men you're not off the hook. you got a consequence too. Now, the consequence that we see for men is it talks about cursed is the ground because of you and in toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles shall grow for you. Thank you, Lord, for that. Don't we say that? You know, they're just going to grow. We don't have to till. We don't have to work for them. They're just going to grow. By the sweat of your face, you will eat bread till you return to the ground because from it you were taken and for you are dust and to dust you shall return. What is this consequence of this uh, toil? It's called work. Work is going to be our, our issue that we're going to deal with. 
men are driven to work. We will become obsessed with it. We will marry it. Uh, we will strive for it. We, we are, are, our first intention is to work and to work hard. In other words, it's a misplaced identity. We're always looking for our identity and where we work. So men, the first thing that we talk about is where do you work? What do you do during the week? We look for identity. Wherever that is, that, that becomes our identity. It's out of this curse that we have to understand that's misplaced. Consequences always bring about a ramification that's not healthy. And this is coming out of this poor choice is the consequences of unhealthy relationships. So you have a, have a wife that's trying to usurp the authority of the man in leadership roles, and you have a man who doesn't want the responsibility and just wants to go to work. Sound familiar? It's our society. And we're driven. That's where our identity is. And out of those consequences, we begin to see that God is trying to show us how bad it is but how good he is. Because what does God do? God in his, his, his great harmony puts the husband and wife together and they work together in the roles. And he, he, he brings the man away from the work and he, he, he puts him back in the family because that's where the identity is. And when the roles are working well and the identity is working well, we see a God-honoring family, a home that honors God. Cain and Abel come out of this, and um, you heard the old saying, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Well, that's about true. Cain and Abel, and, and here are brothers, and, and, and there is this, this brotherly collision. Cain kills Abel all because his sacrifice wasn't good enough for God. All of us are wanting to be accepted by God, and we try to do it our own way. And there's jealousy that comes out when somebody else is accepted before God, and God doesn't accept mine. We blame God. We blame others. And so we try to get rid of the problem. And the problem is always somebody else. Cain is the problem. Or Abel's the problem. So Cain says, if I can get rid of Abel, I'll get rid of the problem. And isn't that what happens in family life? A husband and wife are feuding together, and automatically we begin to say, he or her is the problem. We never deal with the fight. We never deal with the issues. We always make the issues the other person. And if I get rid of the person, I'll get rid of the problem. Well, the downside of that is, Usually they end up remarrying, and they end up remarrying somebody just like they just divorced because they're attracted to that person for a reason. They're going to be re-attracted to somebody else for those very same things. And it's just a, it becomes a snowball event until we learn to deal with the issues and we learn to understand the consequences of poor decisions and to realize I don't have to make them again because God wants a relationship with us. Let, let, let's now take a look at why the poor decision happened. I think this is crucial to come out now, to start at the beginning, and, and here is the reason why. God's word was questioned. When, when we start to question the word of God, we'll make a poor decision every time. Because this is exactly what happens in verse 1. Here is Satan coming and tells Eve, she says, he says, Indeed has God said. Kind of put the question there. Is God's word really trustworthy? And the moment that we begin to question God's word, we're on a path to a poor decision. Immediately as I question the, the, the authority of God and his word, Genesis to Revelation don't detach yourself from the word. Amen. Stay with it. Listen to it. 
Because Satan will always try to get you to question, did God really say that? Did he mean that? Did he really mean that you will surely die if you eat of this? Is God really that cruel that he's going to punish you for eating? He's going to punish you because you are hungry? Is God really going to do that? Jesus in his ministry, makes a huge statement. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except by me. But our society, our culture, our religious uh, desire says, no, that can't be true. There has got to be another way. There's got to be another way. There's got to be another way to live, another way to, to get to heaven. We're always questioning God's word. It's very dangerous to get to that point. It's very dangerous when we start doubting the truthfulness of his word. It's very dangerous when we accept the world's point of view instead of God's view. It's dangerous. Adam and Eve got into that problem because they began to see it from a different perspective. I want to put on some different glasses. Well, yeah, that does look good. Yes, that can be ple- Yes, I can. Oh, well, I think I'll do that. It's all because we question the Word of God. The, the, the second reason this happened is because God's boundaries were exceeded. Everything God created, He created in boundaries. These boundaries were created for our good. Life works well in boundaries. In boundaries. Uh, every sport has boundaries. Now, if you watch hockey, you kind of wonder where, they're all, where they are, but every sport has boundaries. They've got rules. They've got, they got, they got sidelines. They have umpires. They have referees. Uh, guidelines. Boundaries. But Adam and Eve tried to go beyond the boundaries. It didn't work so well. And every time we try to step out, we question God's word, We push the boundaries. When we push those boundaries, we get ourselves into poor decisions. And poor decisions lead to bad consequences, and we have to find out what are we going to do with these bad consequences. Now, you might be here today saying, I'm in the midst of a bunch of bad decisions. I've made a a string of them, and I'm living in a bunch of bad bad consequences. What happens now? We have to come back to the author. Because I think this is interesting. God is going to come to them. He's going to ask this question. Adam, where are you? Adam, where are you? Now, as you take a look at that, you say, does God not know where he put his people in the garden? There's only two of them. Could God lose two people? No. No. He didn't lose them. He wasn't asking for his own purpose. He was asking for our purpose. And here's how we get out of those consequences. This is how we get out of those string of bad bad choices, is we have to be honest with God and say, God, I'm right here. We have to come out from the blame, come out from the shame, come out from, yes, I know there's pain in childbirth. Yes, I know there's a usurping of authority. Yes, I know I find my identity in my workplace. I know that that's how I am bent. I know that's where I'm coming from. But I want you to know, God, I'm right here. I'm coming out before you. God is asking Adam and Eve to come, to come clean. And when they come clean, remember when they sinned, they made their own loin coverings out of fig leaves. And God said, no, that's not good enough. Every time we try to fix our consequences, we make it worse. God comes along and he provides a sacrifice. Here's the first sacrifice. He gives them animal skins. He says, let me give you what will take care of you. Will we trust God to take care of us in the midst of the poor decision? That's the question of the day. We've made a poor decision, but will we come before the Father and admit it? And he has a conversation with them. 
will you have a conversation with God? Not to blame him, but to come clean and start today in a fresh relationship. The consequences are still going to be there. You're still going to have to work your way through them. But now you're going to work them through with God as your advocate. Jesus said, I'm going to go back to my father. And I'm going to send you an advocate. I'm going to send you a counselor, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will guide you and bring things to you that you need to know. So we get the pleasure of walking with the Holy Spirit. We get the pleasure of walking in that garden atmosphere again. Why? Because God desires a relationship with you. So if you're here today and maybe family isn't where you thought it would be because of some poor decisions that were made, we start clean today. We own it. We own it. Say, I made it. And out of that, I come before you, Father. I ask for your forgiveness. And so, Father, give me the Holy Spirit so I can walk in the newness of life. If you have sin in your family, there's only one cure, and that's Jesus. He's the only one that can take those five things that cause family fights. He's the only one that can take those and make a blessed family out of them. He can take those five things. He can turn those things around. He can heal. He can reconcile. He can do a miracle work, but you have to own it. Adam, where are you? He's calling to you. Will you come to him? Will you come? Let's pray. Father, as we...